Well, this morning, I want you all to kind of sit back for a second, calm down for a second, settle into the sermon for a second, and actually consider the question I'm going to ask you. I don't want you to answer it out loud, but just in your mind's eye, actually uh, uh, try and consider the question I'm asking you. What comes to mind when you consider the term church family? What comes to your mind when you hear the words church family? family. Now, I specifically use the word family at the end, because I know if I just said church, many of you would think building, you'd think sanctuary, you'd think the place you maybe grew up, or you'd think this place you're sitting in now. But we know that the body of Christ is the church, that we are the church. We gather in a facility, but the body of Jesus is the church. So we could gather outside, inside, wherever. So what comes to your mind when you think of church family? The body of Christ as family. Maybe you think of a small group you were in in college, or maybe you think of folks that are near and dear to you from a Bible study. Maybe you're newer to the faith, and you're thinking, well, I don't really have a good answer for what comes to mind when you say church family. Nothing really concrete comes to mind. I want to show you two photos that come to my mind when I think of church family, and the first one is this. Now, there's actually no one in this photo, Um, But this is a photo that means a lot to me. This is Becca and I's old house when we lived in Bowling Green. And for about four years, every single Sunday night, literally every single week, 10 to 20 to sometimes way more than 20 than we could handle, people would come and gather in our living room. And our front door looked like that every single Sunday night. Just a pile of shoes in the winter, there'd be a pile of coats, and there'd be scarves and hats over on the steps. When I think of church family, this is what comes to mind because these shoes represent people I love and I care about and we studied the word together each week. Let me throw up the next picture. This is from this past Christmas. When I think of church family, I think of these people. This is our life group here and we were in the Muller's basement and we were doing our white elephant gift exchange. And a white elephant gift exchange is you give the worst or best, depending on who picks it, possible gift ever. This year, I actually got, and I should have worn them today, Carrie, I'm sorry, uh, I got a pair of socks with my face on it. Now, they didn't know that my, I would get the gift, but as fate would have it, and as the Lord ordained, I ended up with Craig Flack face socks, which really, I think we should probably sell at the Welcome Center, because I feel like that could be a hot item. But when I think of church family now in Salina, I think of these people. Now, of course, I think of you all, but when... It's hard when you look out and there's 200 adults gathered in a room to feel overly close. It's like if you went to your family reunion and there was 200 adults, you're probably going to end up talking to 15 or 20, right? When I think about my church family, I think of these people. They're this small group. I think of those moments, those men and women, because we've studied scripture together. We've prayed with one another. We've loved one another. We've laughed with one another. Our kids, there's like... 50 of them, I feel like. They, they're multiplying through COVID, and they are animals. Like, they, we just shove them into the basement normally and just hope there's no blood and hope for the best. We've mourned as a life group together. We've cried together. It's not, it's not united in blood, but in some ways that almost makes it easier because it's the family you choose rather than the one that was just given to you by blood. It's people you choose to do life with. It's having a few close friends that you can call on who are actually following Jesus, who actually take their faith seriously. That's what comes to mind when I say church family, and I'm wondering what comes to mind when I say it for you and you consider it. Some of you have these same types of memories in your head. Some of you have smiles brought to your face, and others don't have much of an experience like that. But it's our version, but it's our vision as a church to be a church that builds deep relationships, because we believe that we're better together, and that together we can have community, and that we were actually made by God for community. It's why, way back when, in the fall of 2019, we launched a small group ministry called Life Groups here at Salina First. We had over 100 people meeting in about seven or eight different groups all around the Grand Lake area before something happened in 2020 that prohibited us from meeting. I forget. They would meet in people's homes on many different nights of the week, 
in just depending on the group and they would choose their own course of study and we used right now media which is a video bible study series it's kind of like think netflix and think it's only filled with bible studies and there's like ten thousand of them it's a great resource that we actually give you all for free and these small groups would pick a video study to work through and they would work through the content and they would gather usually once or twice a month in rotation and today i'm excited to share that our goal is to relaunch these groups in september the truth is, our church looks very different than it did in 2019. The world looks different than it did in 2019. So it's not just a matter of saying, hey, life groups are back, everyone go back to the group you had. There's people that were leading groups then that don't come to our church anymore. There's people that want to be in groups that weren't even here at the church then, and so three years ago looks a lot different. And so we want to kind of relaunch these group and give you guys the apologetic for why I feel you should consider joining a life group. And I want two reasons for this sermon today. The first, I want to try and give you that apologetic, an argument, of why you need community in your life, specifically Christian community. And then I want to share with you our core values of life group, because every church does them a little different. And I want to share how our church looks at small groups that we call life groups. The truth is, if we were just trying to launch them again, we could just do a long announcement and then tell people how to sign up and just kind of explain it to people. But my hope is that at the end of today, those of you who might not be otherwise inclined may jump into a group because you see their value or because you've heard something different. Because some of you hear life group, you hear meeting in people's homes, you hear these kind of small group Bible studies and you think, not for me. Nope, I'm good. I'm not going to some stranger's house. I'm not doing that. I'm an introvert. I don't like people. I'll handle y'all for Sunday morning, but I'm not doing that. And here's the truth. I can't make you do anything. I learned that very early on in my pastoral ministry. You can't make people do anything. And if you don't want to join a life group after today, please know you can still come to church here. You can serve here. We'll love you. You can be a member here. This isn't some type of requirement to get into heaven. This is a thing we think is important. But there's going to be some of you that look at your stage of life and say, right now my spouse and I are working opposite shifts and I only ever see them and there's no way we could be involved in this, that, or the other thing. But I at least want to try to give you an apologetic for why you should be in a life group and why you should have Christian community. So let's start there because here's the basic truth. Community is necessary for Christian health. It's not a luxury item. Community is necessary for Christian health. It's not a luxury item. Too many people look at this idea of building deep relationships and having community and think, boy, that would be nice if it fit in my schedule. It would be nice but I don't really have the time. So they're not willing to sacrifice or rearrange for Christian community. Like, I don't suspect that it will always be convenient to attend a life group. In fact, most of the time it's not because we met on Sunday nights, and I don't know about y'all, but that Sunday afternoon nap and then doing nothing, it's nice. And so sometimes, like, getting ready and going, it's not always the most convenient it's not always what my flesh wants to do to get our kids to go down uh, and meet, but it is necessary for our family and for our overall Christian health. It's not always convenient to come to worship on a Sunday morning. It's not always convenient to be generous. It's not always convenient to pray with your kids. It's not always convenient to take care of your elderly mom or dad, but it is necessary. We need to shift our thinking on Christian community and see it as necessary rather than something that's optional or a luxury item. If you only see it as a luxury item, you'll never invest in it. And here's the thing. We don't miss soccer practice. We don't miss a ball game. Most of us won't miss Saturdays with the Buckeyes because we see it as a priority, something we must do. Yet, so often things of the church and Christ feel like extras, things we can do if we want. Yet the church for 2,000 years has gathered to spend time with one another, to fellowship with one another, to break bread with one another. In countries all around the globe where the church is persecuted, they still gather with one another because they know that community and, excuse me, community and friendships aren't a luxury item. I truly believe the enemy's goal, Satan's goal for all Christians is to have them isolated, lonely, and on their own. 
And it's easy to think to yourself, I don't need anyone. I'm a lone ranger. I'll just do it by myself. People hurt people. They've hurt me in relationships in the past. But if you are really trying to walk this road alone, you won't be nearly as healthy as if you have others in your life. Why? Because isolation is where sin and darkness can run rampant. If you have people in your life regularly checking in on you, seeing how you're doing, asking hard questions, praying for you, laughing with you, being your friend, and having all of that rooted in Jesus, you will be a healthier Christian. You have an opportunity to confess sin, find accountability, and care. I've told some of you guys this, and some of you know this, but the most important relationship I have in my life outside of my wife, adult relationship, is my friend named Matt. And many of you have never even met him, but if you came to my ordination service back in like 2019 when I was ordained with the church, uh, Matt preached that day. He's a pastor up in Michigan, and Matt and I haven't lived in the same town for like a decade. Yet for 10 plus years now, every single Wednesday, Matt and I take our lunch break and we do a video call and we chat and we catch up. So probably 42 out of 50, maybe 45 out of 52 weeks of the year, we don't catch every single one, but the vast, vast majority on a Wednesday at noon, if you ask to meet with me, I will be busy because I am meeting with Matt and we are Skyping. We were, we were doing video calls before it became a thing. And we would just, we just sit, and we have no agenda. We don't read a book together. We're not studying the scriptures together. We do two things every single week. One of us prays at the beginning, just asking God to guide our conversation and prays for us. And then we talk. We ask each other how we're doing. We share what's going on in our life. And then at the end, one of us prays for each other. That's it. That's the only organized thing we have. But when I tell you that God has used that relationship in powerful ways in my life, it would be an understatement. Matt is someone I can count on to love me even when I mess up and point me to Jesus and truth. He can hold me accountable to who I'm called to be. And what I'm trying to say is I would not be the man of God I am, which then flows down into the pastor I am, the father I am, the husband I am, if it were not for Matt in my life. I share this because I want you to know two things. First off, some pastors live in isolation. They don't have community in their life, and then they stand up and they call the church to it, but they kind of stay at a distance. Y'all know I don't operate that way. I'm one of the family. I'm not different than the church family. And in addition, I have community in my life that can call me on my junk, and it can say, that's not right. So I'm not calling you to something I don't live in, but two, I want you to know I'm calling you and I'm passionate about this because I see the benefits in my own life of living in community with other people. Because some of you have convinced yourself that you don't need close relationships, but I'm telling you that you were built for community. We're going to study starting Genesis starting next week, and we're going to be in Genesis for a long time. It's a really big book. We're just going to go through it verse by verse. And what we're going to find is that we were made, literally, for community. That right in the very beginning, it was not good for Adam to be alone, so God made him Eve. We use solitary confinement in this country as punishment for people. And then yet some of us think, well, I don't need people in my life, and yet we use solitary as punishment for people. And the truth is, when we're in Christ, when we're alone and we have no one around us, sin and darkness can run rampant. We need Christian community, and I keep using Christian community because some of you are thinking in here, I've got great friends. And you're thinking of the folks you have around the factory or at work or some friends from high school. And sometimes, I'm not trying to degrade those folks, but sometimes if we're honest, maybe they're not the most best Christian influence in your life? Like, if you go to your friend and you say, hey, my wife and I are having trouble, and their first thing is, like, you need my divorce lawyer? Instead of saying, how can I pray for you and care for you? You probably need to make sure you have some other Christian friends, right? Like, if you go to your friend and you say, hey, I'm struggling with that, and they look at you and they're like, why are you telling me quit being a weirdo? Like, I don't know, like... 
you probably need some Christian friends. You need that Christian community. All of us have friends of men and women that we love that maybe don't know Christ or aren't walking with Christ, that they're still dear friends. But each of us need Christian community that can point us towards Christ because Christian community is not a luxury item. And without it, sin and darkness can run rampant in our life. So how do life groups do this? How do we try and achieve this goal by providing Christian community? What are life groups all about? You can throw up the, the uh, logo there, uh, Bridget. Our three goals of life group in order are connect, grow, serve. It's what they were in 2019. They haven't changed now. Our goals for life group, and they're actually in this order, is that we will connect with others, that will grow in our faith in Christ, and that will serve. And the first is actually the most important of these small groups because it naturally leads, uh, values, because it naturally leads to the other two. These groups are designed to connect with people. The primary focus of life groups is actually not to be the best Bible study experience. Most of you have grown up in churches, and whenever the church gathers, the primary focus is to study the Bible the best way you possibly can. When you come here on a Wednesday night and come to my Bible study, the primary focus is not connection or community. It's to study the Bible the best way we can. That's the number one goal. When you go to a life group, the number one goal is connecting with other believers and building deep relationships. The reason we meet in homes is because it's a lot easier to connect with people sitting around a couch, hanging out, than it is kind of sitting in a church classroom around a horseshoe table where it feels like you're at a board meeting or somewhere else. You're not as relaxed. And so we meet in homes because it's maybe not as great of an environment for like kids and it may be not as great of an environment to study the Bible, but it is a much better environment to connect with people. Take a look at this photo. This was back in 2019. Some of you will, are in this photo. Um, I pulled up to the church, and I actually thought we were being picketed. That was my first thought. I thought, there's protesters at the church. I didn't know what I did to be protested. I just assumed I did something. And it turned out that Mike and Linda Spore's small group was actually just tailgating before church. So they came, and they were cooking breakfast, and they had a TV, and they ran an extension cord through a window or something like that, and they were studying the word together and eating breakfast before church. They were just spending time together. Now, I can almost guarantee you that there are better ways to study the Bible than doing it in the church parking lot off the back of a pickup truck. But I can almost guarantee you there's not better ways to make church community than doing something like that. So I pull in, and I'm watching them, and they're just like, hey, we're just tailgating, and I'm like, all right, you weirdos, that's great. What is going on? And it was just a beautiful picture. And so I show this because I had it, and I thought about it this week. When I say connection is the primary focus, that is it. Our goal is to be with one another. They were eating together. They were studying God's word together. They were making memories together. Other groups, we've done a Super Bowl party every year. I showed you, we've done, we do white elephant gift exchanges on, on our Christmas party at our small group. And this goes back to my time at BG. We don't actually study the word or do anything. We just hang out. We love to eat food at our, so we do meals a lot. We've done Thanksgiving together. We just call it Friendsgiving, and usually it's way more relaxed than your family one. It's actually really nice. Groups have gone to mini golf. They've gone to movies together. They've gone out to supper together. The goal is to build relationships with one another so that when you're having those highs and the lows, you have men and women to go through the highs and the lows with. You have people to do life with that are positive influences and that are pointing towards Christ in their own life. It's why the key goal of life groups is connection. Now, the next goal is indeed growth because we hope that everyone involved in a life group is growing in their faith and understanding of God's word, their circle of Christian friends. We desire life groups to be life-giving and life-growing experiences. Sometimes that growth can just be you showing up to a life group. Some of you will really just struggle going to a life group because you're introverted, you really keep your circle small. So the idea of even going to a group in someone's home terrifies some of you. And I'm not saying that tongue-in-cheek. I understand that. 
And so some of you are just going to be stretched by just showing up. And then group leaders like me know that we better never call on you for something because you just showed up. You're not going to speak, but you're happy to be there. That might be how this stretches some of you, and you'll grow in your Christian faith. Others will have a time of being able to pray for others or being prayed for. Others will be able to study something. Maybe you agree to host. Uh, the Molers host our life group, and I teach. They don't teach, but they have a great home, and they've opened it up. I'm sure that's stretching for them, because just in the same way, going to a group, getting your home ready, and being hospitable, and having folks in, and 35 kids or whatever, like, that's stretching. It'll cause you to grow. Maybe it's the way your group decides to serve that gets you out of your comfort zone and stretches you. Christian growth, growth must be an element because, frankly, you can have community and connection by joining the VFW or the Eagles. If you're really lonely and you go to the Elks every single day, you will meet people. If you join a bowling league, you will meet people. But it might not be Christian people, and it might not push you towards Christ, and it might not help you grow in your faith. So while connection is the primary goal, we want people to grow in their faith. I want to show you the last part, which is service. Connect, grow, serve. These are our kids, well, some of them. Um, looks like we got some Derringers in there, some Flax in there. Um, and so uh, we served as a small group at Call Cafe this past year. Call Cafe serves meals to those in need once a week, and we as a small group went and provided dinner and then served the community. And then we made our kids do dishes, because that's how nice we are. Uh, they were happy about it. That's the age where they still think this kind of thing's fun, right? And so we went and we served together. Now we've done, that was the first time we did stuff like this, but my small group in BG, we did similar things together. But it was just an opportunity for us to do something different. It was an opportunity to bring the kids into being involved in this. And not everyone could make it, and it doesn't always go perfect, but it was an opportunity to serve our community so that the kids could see it as a priority and so that we could be the hands and feet of Jesus together because we had a blast doing it together. Connect, grow serve. We want people, we want our groups to be centered around these three principles. It's why we don't mandate when the groups meet. We don't mandate how often they meet. We don't mandate what they study. The leaders will let me know what they're studying, but we don't mandate what they're studying or how they do certain things. As long as the group is connecting, there's a trajectory of growth, and from time to time, a few times a year, they're finding a way to serve, and it can be as simple as raking leaves. It might be, uh, I know one group sang carols at a uh, nursing home. That wouldn't be my cup of tea, but God bless you if that's your thing. And, and so whatever way they want to serve as a group, we are happy. It's also why we don't divide groups up by age group and say, well, this is the young married group and this is the singles group or this is the one with kids or this is the, you know, the back nine group or the, the slightly older than young singles group, you know, kind of thing. Wherever people want to go and however they want to connect, we're okay with that. Because frankly, you might decide, I want to be in this group or that group. Now, it does tend to work itself out because if you come to our group without kids, you're, you're going to feel their presence, and that can be overwhelming for some. And frankly, we have some groups that were all retirees, and if you show up with four kids, they might be like, oh, well, we have no child care, we have no kids' toys, and there's really not much for them to do, but come on in. So sometimes groups naturally form along those ways, but we don't orchestrate it that way. So maybe today you've decided, I want to join a small group. Maybe today you've heard and you're thinking, I want to be a part of a small group. Well, we have to get this plane kind of running again. So as you came in today, a lot of you were given sheets. And if you didn't get one, you can pick one up at the Welcome Center. But Braden was giving them out to folks. And they're just information forms. And they just look like this. All you need is one person in your family. If you've got a family unit, if you're single, just fill out one of these forms and just put it in a basket right as you leave. And what our goal is, is to kind of try and launch these again in September after Labor Day. You'll give us all the information, and we'll work on grouping folks up. But what we really need is folks that are willing to host and folks that are willing to lead. 
Again, they don't have to be the same people. So you might say, hey, I'd be willing to lead the Bible study. And other people might say, hey, we have a great home for this kind of thing. We'd be willing to host it, and we might pair you guys up. You might be willing to host and lead. It doesn't matter. But some of you are thinking, well, I can't write a whole Bible study. That's not for me. I can't do that. That's why we utilize Right Now Media. Many of you can't do that, but most of you would be able to do a video series and then ask some questions. So, in addition, if you were already in a group back in 2019, make a beeline to that group leader after service or give them a call and say, hey, are we getting the band back together? Like, what's going on here? Are you guys going to host or are we going to do that? The truth is, three years changes a lot, so we just have to try and get this going. So fill out one of these interest forms, and our goal today is to get as many information as we can from folks to see where we're at. Now, some of you, again, go, hey, I attend a Sunday school class every Sunday. I connect, I grow, you know, I'm good. Praise God. You might not be interested in joining a life group, but for some of you, this will be like water on dry ground where you need community in your life and you want to build out those relationships. This is the vehicle we are investing in. Again, each one will meet on its own schedule, so you don't have to put, well, I can't meet every other Thursday, or Timmy's got baseball on Tuesdays, and went, just fill out the form, and we will do the rest. Lastly today, if you have any interest in hosting or leading a life group, come and talk to me, because you are who I need most. The truth is, we will probably have many, many adults go, yeah, I'd join a group. Well, if we don't have hosts and we don't have leaders, that's going to be a problem. Next week, we're going to begin our journey in Genesis, walking through it. But I felt this topic was important enough to pause and reflect, to say why we want this to be a heartbeat of our church. And coming off of last week, where we had a vision statement that says, we want to be a church that builds deep relationships. I wanted you all to see this is the vehicle for way we build those relationships. Let's pray as the worship team comes forward.